Here we go. We're live. <clears throat> I wonder if this is working or not. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Who knows? Perhaps we're going live, perhaps we aren't. Yep, we're going live. Jolly good. <coughs> good afternoon everyone. Um, you see now I've got, in, got into this live business you won't be able to shut me up. Anyway, just a quick sort of broadcast I thought well if I um, did 30 minutes every now and then I, I'm sorry I didn't schedule my life is just so hectic I just can't um, work around that but I just thought well I'd make a quick live broadcast and I've been tinkering around with a piece of software that allows me to display the musical notation on the screen so hopefully I'm just going to check hopefully that should be what you are getting. Yes, you are. Great. That's great news. So you're seeing musical notation on the screen. So in other words, I can, I can sort of play a bit and have the music on the screen as well. Um, well, it's another lovely sunny afternoon in uh, jolly old England, um, <clears throat> in the Peak District. And um, so what better time to share a tune or two with you? I'll just get the bowl. These, I often get asked, what kind of strings do you do you play? I play the ch uh, fairly cheap ones, actually. I use um, Pirastro Tonica medium gauge. They cost me about £22 a set. So they're not very expensive. And they, ask, they actually last for a long time, nearly a year. Um, so I prefer them once they've gone a bit dull, six weeks or seven weeks in. They kind of lose that sharp tone, but of course you'll notice I still use my paper clip on there just to hold the the brightness of the sound of the violin down a little bit. Um, so yeah, I just use basic cheap strings, and um, what else do I use? I use this bow. I have a number of these bows. I get them off eBay. They usually cost about eighteen pound. <clears throat> This one was £18, I think, including the postage, and it came from China direct. I just ordered them directly from China. And um, this is carbon fibre. Um, I don't really need a good bow because I'm a bit rough, so it's fine for me. And uh, what kind of rosin? Um, I use whatever I find handy. I've got this at the moment which is Hydasign, I, I hope that's how you pronounce it, and it's just, I've had it for years, um, and it lasts for absolutely ages, so I'll just put some rosin on the bow, <clears throat> and then uh, talk a little bit about a few tunes. The Wayfarer seems to have created quite a bit of interest, so I've just posted a lesson on that, sort of talking through the tune and just pointing one or two things out. But I, I should point out to you why I composed this tune. I'll just play a bit first. because I like this bit. I tried to get that part in that B section there was because I recognized that um, a run down a sequence of notes or a run up a sequence of notes 
it's very pleasing to the ear. You may remember there's another tune that has a run up that's very popular. See, there's a run going up on that tune, and my tune has a run going down. So I think that's quite pleasing to the ear. So that's what I wanted to get introduced into that particular tune. And I also wanted to give it a haunting melody because, um, well, so many of my tunes are very quick and lively and very danceable. But on this occasion, I wanted to play something that had more of a lilting sound to it. So that was the reasoning behind the tune. So the Wayfarer, yeah, that was why I came up with that particular tune. Um, I'll just see if I can minimise that for a second. Oh, good afternoon to you guys, Sarah and Rose. Nice to see you there. Well, once again, this is a, a completely unrehearsed and um, unscheduled broadcast, but we won't worry about that because um, it's all good fun, really. Um, the next... The next tune I was going to have a little talk about was the Wild Steed, which I wrote a couple of years ago, and it's a basically a good old chunky jig. Um, sounds like this. <laughs> Now that particular tune came from the banjo because I love playing the banjo as well. Um, there we go, this is my beast. This is the banjo I play, which um, has an interesting pedigree to it because I bought this in a junk shop locally and I think it cost, the yeah it did, it cost me 30 pounds in total because the neck was broken. So I got some Araldite glue and a couple of pieces of dowel and stuck it all back together. And this started life as a five string banjo. That's uh, where this thing came from. It was originally a, a bluegrass type of banjo with a nice long neck. Now in actual fact, um, because of the repair job I'd done on it, after a while it started to get a little bit frail a bit tricky to take out anywhere so what I did was um, I got a pal a friend of mine who lives up on the moor to build a new neck for it and he he turned it into a tenor banjo and consequently it has a really nice deep tone Because of that, it inspires me. I can sit with this and think, well, what tune can I play? inspiration really and it's because of its um, the way that you play this instrument 
um, it's quite rhythmical and it kind of keeps <coughs> keeps keeps the rhythm in control in check in a way so you may notice in a lot of my um, uh, videos I use the banjo because it complements the fiddle so well the two instruments really do blend well together and they stand out very distinctly because sometimes when you um, when you record instruments sometimes certain instruments tend to be on the same kind of frequency uh, uh, and so they tend to get a bit lost in a mix whereas the banjo never does so um, when I recorded Tam Lin for instance I used the banjo on about the second or th third time I play through the tune and it really kicks in it really gives the whole tune a lift so I like to use the banjo for that reason I wouldn't say I'm an outstanding banjo player but I, I can play enough to get by and I can play certainly enough to get by in my recordings and add a little bit to a tune so that's the uh, that's the reason why I use a banjo and that's often where quite a few of my inspiration for jigs comes from this instrument I'll sit down and uh, start tinkering around on this thing you do need a fair stretch so it's it's very good for um, for maintaining sort of distance on your fingers and making sure you can reach those those really long notes those long stretch notes so I find that's important so it's useful to play other instruments I find but that's the tenor banjo so there we are <coughs> that's that I'm just going to have a look at you. Oh, good afternoon, everybody else who's um, turned up. <clears throat> that, oh, it wasn't a descending tune. Oh, well, whatever then. Um, uh, I thought it was. Oh, ascending, of course. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, right. So, moving on, moving on. I'll just play another tune now because this next tune has a little bit of significance to it. This one, the Ross Cray jig. In fact, um, my, 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 my heritage is in Ireland, of course, and uh, I go back a few generations, and this is where a lot of my um, family came from. Um, so Ross Cray for me is, is, is actually uh, a little bit special. And that's where this jig came from. So I'll just play a little bit of this for you, just to remind you what it sounds like.
Ross Creed Yig. And um, that's actually, once again, a, a nice sort of double jig. Um, it it kind of like just swings along so re in such a relaxed fashion. Um, you may have noticed there, I wasn't playing exactly to the notation that you see on the screen. That's because sometimes um, I might forget, I might slip up, I might make a mistake, but to try and disguise the mistake, I'll just keep playing throughout and make up a little section of the tune, which is quite interesting really, because that's often how um, a new tune is born, because you'll be fiddling around and thinking, oh my goodness me, I've made a mistake with that part. Let's just keep playing. Let's just keep the rhythm straight. Let's just keep going. So hopefully no one will notice, and they probably won't. And then gradually you'll start to introduce a new section and think, I rather like that. And it kind of takes off on that. And you think, well, I think I'll take that new section and use that somewhere else. So that happens quite a lot. And it's quite nice when it happens because you sort of think, well, it's sort of, it's thinking up tunes on the spur of the moment. And that's, that's quite an important thing. I know a lot of people do want musical notation and they like to feel comfortable reading from musical notation. But really with the fiddle, you've kind of got to get away from that. You've got to feel it. You've got to feel the tunes and you've got to be able to play and sort of not think about musical notation too much. I know it's important. Now I'm the world's worst because I tend to forget a lot of tunes. So I'll maybe just need the notation there just to remind me, first of all, exactly what the tune is. But after that, once I start playing it, it's there. I don't have to refer to the, new, the notation at all. So that's actually a, a skill you develop over the years. So it's, wor it's worth thinking about because um, it does actually, I think, help you in creating new tunes. Um, you could, for instance, start by playing a basic scale. Let's say we, we, we start in the key of D with two sharps, starting on the D string. Do you see straight away there's a new tune appearing there? sounding a little bit like another another tune I know this one the fisher's hornpipe but we usually call it in this these parts the vicious hornpipe because it's not played as a proper hornpipe a proper hornpipe would be played like this not like this So the first version, the nice slow lumpy one.
that's what the um, Kaylee, English Kaylee dancers would much prefer because they have lots of little intricate steps with their feet to get into a tune. And if you start playing uh, a hornpipe too quickly, they will start heckling you. I've seen it and, you know, you, do, you only do it once. And they start, oh, slow down, slow down, you're playing too fast. So you, you quickly learn that hornpipes should be taken at a more sedate, kind of lumpy pace, as it were. But anyway, um, it's nice to play it fast, though. Ah. No, hornpipes are played in 4-4. Four, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Um... Yeah, the Fisher's Hornpipe. Well done. Well spotted there, Ellen. Um, yeah, <coughs> definitely. Um, I like hornpipes. They're, they're, they're sort of um, perhaps not as popular as reels. Jigs are obviously very popular because they're so rhythmical. Um, See, those were both jigs there, um, and of course they were both in six eight timing. One two three, one two three, one two three, one two three. Very bouncy, very rhythmical. Great for dancing too. Um, great for playing down the pub on a Friday night with the band because of course people do leap around after they've had one or two pints maybe to lubricate the joints, and jigs are great for that sort of thing. In fact. Talking of which, Star of the County Down. This is a great tune, great song as well, in Bainbridge Town in the County Down. Um, yeah, it can be a really lively, lively tune to play this one. Great tune, great lively tune, particularly if you've got a singer on board in the band singing away in Bainbridge Town in the County Down. Um, it's a great tune and it gets everybody up and singing around and everything else. There are quite a few songs like that um, which I've played over the years in various bands and the Irish songs are very popular. Um, so it's... There are so many um, that I, I've tried to feature a few of them. Mershon Durkin's a, a favourite of mine. I just love that one. Um, um.
one particular style of bowing there that I was using. Um, it's that sort of double. What that kind of bowing does, it's sort of double bowing. You're, so, you're sort of playing two bow strokes for each note. What it does is it adds excitement to a tune and trust me you kick in with that halfway through that song and um, you've got a, an appreciative audience who may be all on their feet they'll start leaping around no doubt. That was a trick I learnt from a fiddle player called Dave Swarbrick who sadly now is no longer with us but he was my inspiration many, many years ago. I've listened to Dave over the years. Great guy, very friendly, very easy to contact when he was still here and chat about music and tunes and everything. But I learned quite a lot of techniques from him. And that was one thing I particularly picked up on, that when he came in with that double bowing in a tune, it gave the whole thing a lift. And it really does make a big difference. So. You know, okay, the drummer can be t uh, playing his drums and the bass guitarist, but on the fiddle, you've got the you've got the opportunity to really kick out something and make people really stand to attention and kind of leap around a bit. So that's that's the good thing about this instrument. It's very very versatile. You can you can put so much into your playing, no matter what. Um, I'm just going to have a look here at a few of your comments. All right, yes, some people have been playing. I'm, I'm just reading a comment here from um, Jerry. Been playing seven months, finally played the first five bars of Swallowtail Jig. Now listen, sadly, the fiddle seems to be a, 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 a bit of a lifetime commitment, really. I'd love to, um, to say I started three weeks ago, but I would be lying. Um, in fact, I, I started playing the fiddle in my late, late teens and I'm now a senior. I'm not going to say how old, but I am, I'm getting on a bit. And basically, um, yeah, it's been a lifelong thing really, enjoying and playing all the way along. Reason why I started actually out as a guitar player, which is why I've got a rack full of guitars on, hanging on the wall there. I've got lots of guitars. I'm, I'm really a guitar player. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but really a guitar player at heart. I love recording guitar. and But um, the story goes, I was with a band, and it was the band that I'd organised many years ago, a folk rock band. And um, we were doing some recordings and things, and we needed a fiddle. And, um, right, who's going to volunteer? Well, everybody took one step back, except yours truly. So I was left carrying the baby, basically. So um, off I trot, I was working in London at the time, down to the East End, and uh, there was a, a very interesting music shop there. It was, very, it was like something out of Harry Potter. It really was. There, was all, there weren't just musical instruments. In this old shop in Shoreditch, there weren't just musical instruments in there. There were all sorts of bits and pieces hanging down like stuffed animals and all sorts you, you couldn't believe it and the people the people um behind the counter they were ancient you know you, you it was like it was like stepping back in time it was wonderful and as a young guy working in this part of london and it, it wasn't it, it was quite under underdeveloped then it was quite a poor area um places um like Petticoat Lane, you could still go down there and buy a, buy a second-hand fiddle for a few bob, literally. In fact, I've got one still knocking about somewhere. But anyway, this shop, um, it, it, it had a selection of instruments, and, and the one I bought was this very cheap, probably a five-pound or so, a fiver, something like that, Skylark fiddle. Well, it was, it was dreadful. But to me, it was brilliant. So I started learning on this thing. 
and um, yeah, it, it taught me the rudiments. And I got these um, Tuna Day books. I got I got bought one for two and six. It was in, in which in that was in old money. In um, in modern day money, two and six. Goodness me, twelve and a half p maybe. Anyway, so I bought this book and um, it had a few ideas in it, like, you know, how to tune the thing up and um, where to put your fingers and everything like that. And it sounded like a cat's chorus. It, it was sounded dreadful. But anyway, I found that if I stuff some stuff in here, put some foam or something into the F holes, it quietened it down a lot. So I didn't disturb too many of the the local neighbours and everything. Uh, there we go. So, you know, it started from that. And um, next thing you know, I found, I got this, um, I think Dave Swarbrick gave me the idea, he got this this bit out of a telephone, an old-fashioned telephone, the old, the, the transmitter bit, which was made of carbon granules. And here's a science lesson. Now, if you put a little electric current through carbon granules, the current the electric the voltage will alter slightly as you the airwaves strike the surface i know i'm getting technical here but i come from an electronics background you see anyway so the um the voltage chain and it basically acts as a microphone so stuck that on there and away we go i've got an electric fiddle hey presto we're playing fiddle within a few about maybe three or four weeks and it must have sounded dreadful um, I was asked recently, have you got recordings? I'm sad to say, yes, I have. But I'm, I'm too, too shy to post them because they sound so bad. But maybe one day when I've had a, drink, a glass of whiskey or something, I will upload them to YouTube and pretend it's somebody else playing. But yeah, I've got them on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, would you believe? I still keep one of those. Um, there you go. So... Uh, you know, keep at it, because my first violin was dreadful. It was like made of plywood or something. Um, but if you've seen a recent video I made about a cheap violin that cost me £30 off eBay, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, the quality is outstanding. So, you know... Um, Nowadays, cheap, I think cheap violins are a lot better made than they once were. Um, but stick at it for a few years and keep at... Oh, go to sessions where you play with other musicians. So um, if um, you play with other musicians, you, you develop more confidence. I'm just going to close this door because I think there's, a, there's an oven making a whistling noise. <coughs> There we go. <clears throat> you can guarantee either an oven's going to whistle or a fire alarm will go off or something unexpected will occur. But there you go, we're live We're live here on YouTube tonight or this afternoon. It's nice to see so many of you joining me. Thank you very much indeed. I know I'm rabbiting on a bit here because uh, I tend to like to um, talk about what I play and where the tunes come from and the background to tunes and even the background to where I bought instruments in the past. Um, yeah. Can you... Can you idea? Not this time, next time. Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> Daniela, what kind of idea was it, you, was it you were hoping I might send you? Perhaps you could just make a comment there. Um... Three years, yeah. Three, uh, I'm just reading reading a comment by uh, Sarah or Sarah, who's mentioned um, who's been playing now for three years and it's sounding good. Yeah, you should be sounding good by three years. Time to hit those sessions. It's time to, time to start playing out, playing in front of people if you don't already, because that really does develop your confidence. Um, it's not nothing like. Um, there's, there's nothing like getting up on the stage and just playing and, um, you know, it's a different kind of buzz because you get the audience, maybe if they like what they hear, they're clapping or they're dancing. 
so it kind of gives you that confidence. Um, yeah, Robert, you're asking, have I played in the pub? Yeah, I've done loads of pub gigs, loads of pub gigs. Uh, I used to have a band um, called Lan... No, not Lanigan's Ball. Um, Kiss the Blarney. I was with them for a few years. I formed it with a pal of mine who lives close by, a banjo player and a very good vocalist and a bass player. And we went out as a band called Kiss the Blarney for quite a, quite a number of years, playing all the pubs, local pubs and things. And yeah, it's a real, you know, you earn your money. It's not a lot of money, but you do earn it, but you do get a lot of appreciation. And um, yeah, we played out as a, a pub band, Irish pub band. And um, then of course, on a Saturday night, we played Kayleys. So that worked quite well. Um, so it was it was a good way of doing things. Oh yes, played lots of weddings, Robert. Yeah, lots, hundreds, hundreds. I've been playing in Cayley bands for, well, my last band, Peak Folk, we were together for 16 years. Um, I disbanded the band two years ago because I just felt that it was time to move on. I've done Cayleys for years and years different bands. I played with another band called Albirio um, for some time and then of course now Tom Kitchen plays for Albirio. You may have heard of him. He's a well-known um, folk fiddle player in England. Uh, has a very unique style. If you haven't heard of Tom Kitchen, uh, look him up. He writes books and he performs all over the place. Um, so he's, he now plays for Albirio but I played with them for many years. Um, yeah, various bands. So I played lots and lots of weddings, birthday parties and all sorts of things. Many, many gigs over the years. Um, yeah, uh, helicore strings make sense. Uh, yeah, uh, um, I like, I'm finding I like quite like dark strings. So I prefer these um, Tomastic um, Pirastro Tom, um Tonicas, um, because they go a bit dark after six or seven weeks. Um, I would buy, um, I would buy um, Dominance, uh, but they don't seem to last as long somehow. They seem to last maybe um, three or four months, and then they seem to uh, lose their, um, lose everything somehow. The, the life seems to go out of them. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, string, oh, it's an awkward thing, strings, because I think every violin has a different sort of setup required. So some violins require different types of strings. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult to know because, for instance, the electric violins, they seem to be quite happy with whatever strings you put on them. Um, but yeah, I, I do stick with strings that basically don't cost a fortune because cost of violin strings these days it's so expensive um, <clears throat> yeah not many fiddle schools in Germany yeah I don't know about that I, I, I do have relatives in Germany in fact my grandchildren are over there so um, yeah I know there are the vocal vocals choirs are very important in Germany and of course electronic music craft work and the like is, is big is big time over there so um, yeah but I'm not sure about fiddle schools you can learn a lot from YouTube of course I, I know you know that I do my sort of, I've did a, about 11 or 10 or 11 introductory fiddle uh, videos for learning to play the fiddle and I also did um, 10 or 11 intermediate ones as well to kind of kickstart anybody into um, into picking up the instrument and trying to uh, to, to to learn to play it, um, I didn't charge anything because I'm not a big believer in you know charging people for violin lessons unless because at the end of the day they might decide it's not what they want to do, <clears throat> um, and also YouTube gives you some some some. A small amount back so that's good that's good that works and it's a nice platform to um, to put new ideas and tunes out and also do this sort of thing because uh, yeah this is this is brand new for me so uh, 
any any errors or mistakes just pretend that I meant to do them all right so if I if I play something that's what I meant to do really I didn't mean to play Okay, that was purely random playing. I've I've no idea what I was playing there. I was kind of making it up as I was going along. Um, that's a great thing, you know, because um, if you can do that, if you can develop that skill, that's how your compositional skills will 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 happen. You'll suddenly get new ideas. Um, it's because I think your mind gets used to exploring new tunes. I think, um, I find this a lot. This happens a lot. I often mention in my videos, I picked up the fiddle one day and this tune just came to, came to me. Well, that is exactly what happens. Um, I can just take the fiddle off the wall. I think, right, I'm going to play 20 minutes of, of fiddle music before lunch or something like that. And all of a sudden, a tune will just leap out of the instrument without any forethought or anything. Now, like what you just heard there. I might play it a couple of times and think, yeah, that's not bad. I might just add a few notes in there, or I might just change the B section, perhaps put it into a different key or do something a bit different. And all of a sudden, hey presto, a new tune is born. And you think, quick, let's hit the record button on the computer. I've got a couple of um, studio mics here. And hey presto, a new tune is born. And then you perhaps go and have your lunch, come back after lunch and say, yeah, let's have a listen to it. Yeah, it's not bad. Or you might just think, I'll do a slight bit of alteration. But that, that way, a new tune can, can come to your mind quite quickly. And I, and I don't know what it is, really. I think it's, it's by, over the years, playing lots of different melodies and playing in sessions where you're busking and you're trying to make things up on the hoof, then um, it, it does tend to, make your, um, tend to make your creative, it improves your creative ability, I think. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. Um, I think there was a guy called Ed Edward de Bono. Was it Edward de Bono? I remember reading about him. He's either a psychologist or um, something, something beginning with the letter P. Anyway, a very interesting guy. And he, he described the way that the mind thinks. And um, you can get into a rut. In other words, if you do things the same thing over and over and over, your brain will automatically go for those sort of routes. It will automatically decide, yeah, I've done this before. This is the easiest way to do it. Whereas if you try and do different things, like maybe play different genres, 
try playing a bit of um, sort of gypsy style fiddle or a bit of Irish fiddle or a bit of Cape Breton fiddle or a bit of Canadian style fiddle, um, old time fiddle, you know, country western maybe or even a, something a bit more, you know, electronic, maybe a little bit of drum and bass or something like that. Try these different things out. What it does is it, it kind of opens your mind to thinking in, in different ways, and I think that's so important. It's like playing different instruments, really. It's like playing the piano or playing the synthesizer or creating new sounds. You're always trying to think of different things, so um, it kind of expands the horizons. Right, too much talking here. Let's have a look at some of your comments. Sir, how much does the quality of wood of the bridge affect the sound of the violin? I have a bad sound. Yeah, I, I think it does. I think, now this one was done when I bought this fiddle. This was a Jay Hayde fiddle. Um, which I bought secondhand about 10 years ago now um, from a gentleman in Buxton in the Peak District. Um, Colin Cross, violin maker. I think he's still on the web. Anyway, um, this I believe was a Chinese violin. Yeah, a Chinese violin and then taken to the States and they worked some of their magic in the J. Hayde workshop put it back together or did whatever they do to it and they made a very nice sounding fiddle. So the bridge on this one is quite thin as you'll notice because this one does seem to have a nice mellow tone. I like this one a lot. Now if I come to another fiddle, da, 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 there we are, this is my, this is one that was given to me by my neighbour before she passed away, a very elderly elderly lady, nearly a, she got to nearly a hundred. And she heard me scraping away one day and said, um, would you like my old violin? I said, well, thank you so much, yes. And she said, well, I'd rather give it to you because I know that you'll play it. And this is my other fiddle that I sometimes do I record two. T I, I sometimes record one melody with this one, and then play the same melody on this one, and it gives it such an extended tone. On this one, you'll notice the bridge is thicker because I bought a, a whole load of bridges from um, eBay once again for about a fiver. I got about twelve bridges for a fiver or something, and I've left this one purposely thick. Now, on the, um, if I can find it, no I can't at the moment, but on the cheap 30 quid violin that I bought from eBay, I made the bridge very thick on the top, so I didn't, I didn't thin it down. And what I found that does is it tends to take out some of the harshness of the violin. Now, it's probably terribly wrong to do but for me it works so if I need to get rid of any harshness I have quite a thick I leave the top of the bridge quite thick now moving on from there a stage let me say oh let me show you this <clears throat> this violin my electric violin I call this one the scorpion of course You'll notice the bridge is double thickness on this. Now that's because I found that if you make the bridge a lot thicker, it tends to kill a lot of those harsh nasal sounds that you get with electric violins. Um, it's something to do with the, 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 the pickups being so responsive to any sound, so they pick up the sound of the bow scraping across the strings but yeah so yeah the thicker the bridge the top of the bridge seems to make a difference so if you're a bit concerned about your violin sounding a bit harsh you could always try buying a new bridge get they're fairly cheap and just leaving the top a little bit thicker just sanding it down and not thinning it down too much and see what it does 
you'll probably find all the luthiers now will turn around and say, you're wrong, you're doing this all wrong. But hey, I live from experience and I've learned that works for me, so it might work for you. Who knows? <clears throat> um, no problem if you need to go. I, I should be... I should be finishing. I'm going to be in big trouble because I know my tea is is, is sitting at the table, getting cold. Um, been learning for just under. This is R. Pattenden. Been learning for just under a year. Going to play at a pub session tomorrow night. Great. You'll have a great time because um, um, there's another gentleman person called Rob Clark who um, I know a Rob Clark because he was the gentleman that did my um, my banjo conversion, which was fantastic. Um, any tips on getting to like the E string? Oh, they, they all sound shrill. Um, I sh they all sound shrill for some reason. I did buy some of those um, strings that are supposedly non-whistling they still whistled. That's what I found. Um, so the only thing I found that works for me is the paperclip on the E side of the bridge. It, it works for me, certainly. Apart from that, in a recording, I will tend to take the EQ. I just tend to drop off the EQ on the top end to take any harshness out. Plus, of course, um, the room quality makes a difference to the sound of the violin. This room reflects a lot of sound. There's a lot of mirrors here, so it, you can imagine it reflects all the high piercing sounds. So I, I use EQ to remove that if possible. Um, but as soon as I go into the hallway or downstairs, I, I notice that the, the violin sounds more mellow. So the, the walls aren't reflecting as much of the higher higher frequency sounds so it, it could be that you um, just need to go and sit in the wardrobe and play but no seriously um, a paper clip usually works quite well on that one um, have I answered all the questions yeah if you studied that uh, this is only only abrigo if you've studied classical violin and now just getting into fiddle it's a great eye-opener um, the thing is, is to um, get the bow, get the fiddle, not worry about technique. I know you're supposed to worry about technique. You're supposed to hold the bow in a particular way, hold the instrument in a particular way, and do everything in a particular way. But with fiddle playing, that all goes out of the window. You can just...
the window. <laughs> well, I think I better finish off now. I think, have you heard of the Dublin? Oh yes, of course I've heard of the Dubliners. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, whiskey in the jar. Oh yeah, I've sung that one and played it and um, ah, ba ba ba, whiskey in the jar. Mm, I have to remind myself of that one, but I've played that. Yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah, I haven't sung it for a few years. I must admit, but it's a great tune. Um, yeah, da, 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 da. that's one. I'll have to put that one in on my next live broadcast. And um, just to frighten everybody, I might even sing it. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see now. I think I've covered all the questions you've mentioned. I, I, if there's any I've missed, I, I, I can certainly go back over these comments. They, they pop up on YouTube a day or so a day or so later so I can kind of answer perhaps some of the um, queries that you've made um, yeah we've gone about the quality of the wood <coughs> uh, the Dubliners yeah we like the Dubliners um, mm, let me just have a look see if I can find my lyrics um, the Dubliners Excuse me while I do this for a second. I'm just going to have a look for lyrics. I'm just thinking of another tune, actually. There's another great tune. Um. That's the one. Right up in the black pulpit band. That's another classic tune, of course, that um, always goes down well. And other tunes, of course, that we see, uh, that the. Um, I've been the world rover for many a year. No, there are so many. There are so many um, that I could do. Um, yeah, maybe for another time. I think now I need to um, perhaps finish off and um, perhaps do another live broadcast in a few days' time. Um, all being all being well, it, it it seems to be all working okay anyway. So that that's good news. And um, I've probably spoken enough now. You're probably fed up with the sound of my voice. But there you go, all good fun. Um, yep, it's quarter past six in the UK at the moment. We're on British summer time, where we put the clocks forward by one hour. So I have no idea what the time is in, in the US of A, because of course you have different time zones. So um, yeah, I'm probably gonna miss out quite a few people, but of course this does stay on YouTube. So you can, um, you can listen to my rambling at your leisure okay so I think that's all now I think we've had a look at a few things we've had some fun we've had some fun and um, yeah we've, we've just a, a bit of a bit of fun anyway um, enjoy the rest of your week and the weekend and uh, have a great time with your fiddle playing <laughs>